uh, this polling thing to ask you questions and get some feedback. We're going to go a little bit slow through it. And right, so some take-home messages before we get into the fun part. Um, signs of insects can be tricky for diagnosing what pet, what pest you're dealing with. So we're going to go through some of those signs to make sure you know who you've got. Most of you are pretty good at it. There's a couple of things where we get emails in the home citrus, some are from you, some are from other people, that they're just not sure and they're not really sure what they're looking at. So that's why I, I snagged a bunch of these pictures. Joan's not allowed to answer questions because um, a lot of these are ones that she sent me that were quite useful. So, sorry, you, you can quietly, you can answer on your phone if you want to, just don't tell anybody. Um, so in addition to pest insects, we have a lot of good predatory insects in Florida. So I wanted to make you aware of some of those. We'll point out some of the common ones. Um, so this is going to be images submitted to our team. Again, if, uh, if, if anybody in addition to Joan happens to see one of their pictures up here, please don't be the person who answers it uh, out loud. We do actually want you to put it through the poll on your phone, and then we'll talk about them. Um, and then we want to recognize some common predatory bugs, since we don't want to kill them. We, we really want them. You guys work hard to get nice gardens going. We want to promote the good stuff. All right, so many insects and mites affect tree health, so the identification is really important. Sometimes we get things that people are concerned about, and it turns out that it's actually not a problem at all. Not necessarily good, not necessarily bad, it's not a problem. And so some of these images, like I said, are from our collaborators, they're from our home citrus email. Uh, keep plugging that email address. We've gotten so many great questions out of it, things that we hadn't thought about, so thank you for that. Um, yeah, there's my rule. If you submitted the photo, don't tell everybody what it is. All right, so. This is going to come up in your poll. And as you answer it, I want to know if you know what this damage is caused by. And as you answer it, the answer is going to pop up up here. So you're going to type them in. I'm meaner than Megan. I actually have to type in answers. <laughs> Just don't tell anybody else the answer. You can, you can participate in the poll if you want to. I've already seen the right answer called a couple times. Has everybody had a chance to answer? All right, since this was obviously Joan's picture, other than Joan, what is this? I guess I could be nice. You guys did try already. <laughs> this is spider mite damage. So if you took that leaf off, and I have a leaf like this that I plucked off of a tree two days ago. Um, if you took that leaf off and you flipped it over, you would actually see um, egg casting or shell exuvia from them molting. You'd see empty eggs. You might even see adults. Spider mite, yeah. <laughs> um, so signs of spider mites. Uh, Angela went over some of these out in the groves. Oh, did you guys get enough time to take a picture? All right, cool. Um, Signs are going to be webbing. That's usually the obvious one on that far left picture. We don't see as much of that in open groves as we do in like nurseries and greenhouses. But a lot of times we just see this like yellow splotchy stuff on the top of your leaves. When you flip it over, you actually see the spider mites. Um, and so the management for this, what we generally recommend people do, make it easy. Spider mites don't like water and they're easy to dislodge. So we will take our sprayers and we will spray up into the canopy with just water. And that usually knocks a lot of them down. It's very simple. Um, it doesn't require any extra chemistry being added. And you're going to water your tree anyway. So you just dish it up into the canopy a little bit. And here your IPCs, open the bottom, spray it up in there a little, close it up. Great. It works wonderfully. Um, you could also use horticultural oil if you'd really like to. And we do those horticultural oil treatments. A lot of times it's because we have things, we know we're going to have spider mites, or we know we're going to have rust mites, we know we're going to have aphids, and that works pretty good on all of those. Oh, my pictures are out of order. Oh yeah, so sorry, this is my rust mites. I forgot to have a picture for, uh, question for you. So we also have rust mites. You may or may not have seen these. The ones on the very far left, that's what they look like. They're so small. This is a huge magnification of them. They're so incredibly small. And if you're somebody like me and you're out in the field scouting, you're actually turning the fruit to make them run out of the shade area so you can count the number of bodies running. 
I can't really see the individuals outside. I just see them running, and that's how I count. Um, yes? We have the other inserts oh. for you. We took them out so you didn't get all the answers. Oh yeah, so after my presentation, uh, folks at my group are going to hand out these slides. There's a reason they're missing. I should have thank you, Jamie. I totally forgot that. Um, <laughs> my bad. Um, so signs of the, of the rust mites on the leaves, sometimes you'll see distortion on the new growth. You're probably not going to see a look at a lot of this. We do see a little more abundance of these in uh, the bags or the IPCs in commercial settings. Um, mostly because there's a nice shade in there. Rust mites love shade. And so if you give them a shade habitat, they're a lot happier. As you start seeing fruit coming on your trees in a couple of years, you might see more of it. Um, so you get some brown lesions on lower leaf surfaces, some chlorosis. They're out there, they're in the habitat, they blow around in the wind really easily. They get around. On your fruit, I do have a picture of a piece of fruit with some nice bronzing on it. You get different bubbles, you have different names for so the one in the picture we call bronzing, you see it's kind of like that shiny color. That's going to be damage that happens when cells are already expanded in your fruit. So it's happening on the very certain cells of the plant. And then this is kind of like shark skin light. I couldn't find a really great shark skin picture. But essentially what you have here is this is damage that happened earlier in the development of the fruit. And then that fruit's developed out. All the cells in the exterior are kind of gnarly and they feel like shark skin. And they kind of look like shark skin. This will turn whiter over time. Um, that's going to be, again, stuff that happens earlier in Fruit development. So if you see this stuff come to your clinic, you're going to have the pictures um, to help you out and know what you're seeing. You'll probably see a lot of rust mite. They're just all over the darn place in Florida. There, it's not the end of the world. A little bit of rust mite damage, I've been told, makes a slightly sweeter fruit. So if you don't care if your fruit aren't beautiful, you're still going to taste just fine. Okay, next poll question. What is this? I think this was a Joan one. Yeah. It's not <laughs> Oh, somebody got technical on me. Who's that grass person? You want to sign up to it? We'll see if he's not typing. <clears throat> All right, I think most of you have your answers in. So we're going to flip. I have not seen the right answer. Really? Because mm -mm. this is a rare one. Citrus black fly. We hardly ever see it in the commercial settings. There's a lot of stuff that eats it. They're also really easy to control with a lot of the other chemistries you put out. We do tend to see it in residential planting because there's just less chemistry being applied on a regular basis. The great thing is, lots of things eat it. So the signs you're going to see is like dark spots. If you look really closely at them, they're dark with like white fringe around the outsides. Um, so they're kind of pretty. The first time I ever saw one, I was confused what it was because I never heard of that before I went to Florida. And it turns out this is a common organism. They happen. Um, I'm accustomed to white flies. These are a type of white fly. They're just black. Um, so these are going to be underneath your leaves. Sometimes they'll just color the leaf, the top of the leaf below it because you have all the sitting mold growing on the um, honeydew that they're excreting. Usually we tell people not to manage them because there's a lot of predators in the environment that will consume them. Again, you're going to get all this, so if you don't want to write it down, you don't have to worry about it. You're going to get these slides. Um, and if, if for some reason you're not getting them controlled by your predators, if you see it one week, you come back two weeks later, population grew, you don't see any reduction, you could go through and add them to the fungi. You can use more cultural oil or you can use soap, all of those to disrupt them. And quite frankly, if I had a population this small, I'd probably just switch it um, because it's easy and cheap. <laughs> all right, we got another question. I think you guys can answer this one. What, who caused this damage? Who caused this damage? Next 
They used to have an easy one after that last one, isn't it? <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and move to the next slide. See, this is Leaf Miner, and everybody's getting it right. You guys are awesome. Good job. <clears throat> so, signs for your citrus leaf miner leaves wrinkled, upper surface is discolored, mines are normally easily visible. You flip it over and you look at the lower surface. Um, I have some nice vines in the show and tell portion of the day, and Megan also has some ones that have uh, sprouted some nice canker for you. And uh, if the pressure's high, sometimes you also see the mines not only on the lower surface, but you see them on the top surface of the plants. They'll go down the stems, they can even go on to your fruit. Um, and on the west coast, they have a thing called citric pool miner. We haven't seen it here. Sometimes our citrus leaf miner mimics um, the same kind of damage on the fruit peel. It's just a high pressure instance. We see it sometimes in our, our station grows. So for the management of your garden, your best, your most effective tool for leaf miners, and you asked me a question earlier, um, this is what you want to use. This is a pheromone-based trap. So this puts out the sex pheromones that they're attracted to, and this is going to interrupt your feed. These, um, these pheromones last for up to three months. I don't know if three months is actually accurate in Florida, but basically we're going to have, I should have grabbed the trap, these cardboard traps we call a delta trap. It's sticky, super sticky on the inside. Don't touch that hard. It's going to be all over you, and it's hard to wash off. Um, and then you get this little rubber septum, this little gray thing. It has a pheromone in it. You put it in the trap. You hang it in your tree. They go there. They don't make. It reduces your pressure immensely. Um, so they can last up to three months of the deal. I usually change mine out about every two months just to be safe because Florida is so hot that sometimes things degrade a little bit faster down here. So if I'm relying on this, that's what I've used in the past. Um, parasitoid activity at home garden is going to be pretty rare. So we do have some parasites. We have some predatory wasps that lay eggs in it. And it's kind of cool if you have a, a little pupa and you flip it over and you open the leaf curl, you'll see instead of one little sausage case, you'll see like three or four little sausage cases, and that means they're parasitized. I guess I don't have a better analysis. Uh, analogy, but they kind of look like little sausages. Um, the middle of the dredge that you're using once a year can help keep it down, but it's a really low rate, so the likelihood of it actually being enough to control is pretty, pretty minimal. Um, and make sure you follow the label if you're going to add more of that or if you're going to use it in another setting. There's your parasitoid. So, Agenia aspis citricola is the most common parasitoid that we do find here. They actually uh, release two parasites for this particular uh, pest. And this is the one that did the best. And so this is what I'm talking about the sausage casings. So if you were to open up um, a curl or a leaf where they're pupating, you'll see like three little sausages and these parasites a multiple times. You get three wasps for one, three to four wasps for one um, leaf miner. So before we had heavy psyllid management, this was a really great tool for managing the leaf miners. Um, and they're usually observed later in the season. So early season pest pressure, early season flush didn't get the kind of control the late season flush would get. Um, now, I've seen parasitism in the field once, and I've been here for five years. So it's not to say it can't happen, it's just to say it's going to be rare. So if you have a big problem with them, that pheromone is probably your better bet. Again, you're going to get these handouts. Next image. What is this? The stuff that's on the leaf. Y'all have seen this before. Pretty sure. All right, so we have both what it is and one of the things that promotes it coming up as common answers. So, what you're seeing on the leaf surface is actually city mold. And city mold grows on the honeydew that's extruded by extruded, sorry, by things like scales, aphids, and mealybugs. So scales can be one of the feeders of city mold, for lack of better terminology. All right, so like I said, city mold. Um, if you see city mold, you probably want to look up and see what's above it, because that means there's probably a pest of some sort above it making honeydew. 
Um, and so some of the common ones we see are scales, mealy bugs, aphid, aphids, Asian citrus slugs, they'll point you with their waxy honeydew. It does actually promote um, the mold growth, white flies, black flies, plant hoppers, lots of things make honeydew. Uh, so there's just a couple examples there. There's um, citrus white fly, this is cotton efficiency. Oh, we don't really see much of this in Central Florida, but if anybody's coming down in North Florida, it's more of a problem there and in Georgia. Uh, this is loving mealy bug, but this is that newer mealy bug I mentioned is a real problem if it gets in your um, IBCs. And so I didn't bring those out for show and tell today, but if you should happen to hear about the mealy bug and this switch is purple, let me know. It's the only one that's purple in this state. All right, next critter. Kind of an unfair question, by the way, because it's kind of a life stage you don't see too often. All right, we got a pretty good range of answers here, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, stick our L. All right, I'm going to go ahead and flip over the answer. So this is probably some type of a plant hopper molting. I would have said psyllid, but it's a lot bigger than a psyllid based on the leaf size of what was sent to me. Um, so it could be one of the many plant hoppers that we have in Florida. We have a lot of things that like to feed on psyllids. And psyllids actually do look a lot like that when they're molting. So if you see something like that, it's, old, it's really small, it's probably a psyllid. Um, the plant hoppers have what we call a complete metamorphosis um, for the molds between life stages. So what you're seeing was actually the next life stage looked like an adult on the wings molting out of the previous life stage. It was a really cool picture. I have no idea who sent that one in, but it was a cool picture. So I figured I'd throw it in there so you guys see it in case you have that come to your clinics. All right, who caused this damage? Ooh, we have two circles on here. Did I mean to do that? Oh, did I have two answers? Okay, well, you can give me two answers then. I don't think the rebel one's supposed to be there. That was probably an error on my. Sorry. And you know, if you were there this morning, you kind of probably know the answers. <laughs> Ooh, somebody's very specific. <laughs> You guys know most of your critters, which is awesome. <laughs> I love that. Whoever would put that in, that's one of the best children's books on earth. All right, so everybody pretty well have a chance to answer? All right. So that was the minor damage. I was actually more interested in the chewing damage. I think the red thing was a mistake that I must have left on from another presentation. I am so sorry. Sorry, extension staff, I didn't catch that. Um, so it was chewing damage. It could be a number of different things. And so you guys correctly said it could be one of the wheels, it could be a, a, a caterpillar, it could be a lot of things. And in our citrus system, we have a lot of things that like citrus, like I said. We have grasshoppers, we have katydids, we have um, various caterpillars, so those are kind of two common caterpillars, two of them more common you're going to see between the orange dog, the pretty big one, and then that's an army worm. We actually do see a lot of army worms coming to citrus these days. Um, and then we have, uh, that's a, a immature katydid at the very end. Diacrepes root weevil, which we didn't see today because they're not very common in residential settings, although they are becoming more common because they do like a lot of horticultural plants. So I have some in the back for you to see if you've never like seen them before, I have them. And then, Remember uh, the field I mentioned that Sri Lanka weevil and Sri um, leaf notcher are hard to tell apart. They are very similar looking. Uh, Sri Lanka is on the left, leaf notcher is on the right. It's just the top right here. Those are 
easiest way to tell them is to look. There's a nice, really nice Venus document that does this. Um, and as I usually pull that up when I'm looking at the beetle and I can't remember which one's which, I just pull that document. And then our blue green weevils, which are super duper common. They all like to chew on the leaves. They basically cause different size leaf damage. The big thing with root weevils is actually not the foliar damage, it's the below ground damage their larvae cause. So we gotta think about that. If we see a lot of damage, we probably need to think about watching for some phytophthora symptoms in the future because they will their larvae eat on the, the, um, the roots. When you have holes in your roots, Holes in your roots, let's pathogens into the roots, and that's, that's problematic. And that's when you ask Dr. Doogie for help, not me. Oh, I thought I had no slide. Okay, submitted image seven. Most of you know this one, because I also just showed you a picture of an older version of it. I really should have thought out the order of this better. <coughs> Jamie can laugh at me, she needs it. So since most of you do know what this is, it's not lime swallowtail yet, um, but that is uh, that is actually an orange dog. If you live in a region that you're concerned about lime swallowtail, we can talk afterwards. It's not going to be a huge problem, and that's the short answer of it. It's going to affect homeowners. That's about it. Just toss them into the water. You know that that FDAX is dealing with it, so hopefully they can eradicate. But it, it won't be a big problem. So orange dog caterpillar. They look like bird poop. So whoever said that, yeah, it totally looks like bird poop. Um, especially in those younger stages, and then when they get a little older, they have those osmeteria that come up, and they're great and scary, and they're, they're so much fun when they get bigger. Um, the head capsule case takes on this snake-like appearance, so they kind of throw people off the first time they see them in a tree. And then the adults, this gorgeous butterfly, and it's a great pollinator. Um, there's a couple different sizes of, um, of the orange dog caterpillars that we found a couple years ago in one of my growers' fields. I like the size of the all right, we got another submitted image. I've got to be close to done with how many I put in. Oh, goodness. I'm going to run out of time, aren't I? Yeah, although I'll have to skip ahead a little. Sorry, Jamie, I'm having too much fun. That's great. <laughs> I'm watching. Okay. That's why I was like, oh, I'm gonna run out of time. You've got yeah, but I have stuff to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> Not that much, but I have something I want to talk about. All right, most of y'all know this. It is a leaf roller. They're they're kind of a fun little find. Um, so these are not host specific. They'll eat almost any plant that the egg is laid on. Um, and where you see is those, those leaves get kind of glued together, the little caterpillars spin webs between the leaves and consume the foliage. Sometimes they can even actually put their leaves onto fruit and then they will consume the fruit too. So sometimes they make some really weird immature fruit with holes through it. And a lot of times it's these guys actually causing that little close relative of them. Um, it can be really damaging for your plant growth. So your best management options of it are going to be either manual removal or application of BT. So BT, Bacillus uh, thuringiensis, was originally formulated uh, to be targeted on lepidopteran pests, so caterpillars. And it affects just the caterpillars. The version that's sold for caterpillars only affects caterpillars. Great product to use for, for them. And actually, I recommend it most of the time over most of the chemistries in the field if I see um, a major caterpillar problem. We actually did have a leaf roller relative that caused a lot of damage a couple years ago. And we used BT to clean it up because it was the most targeted approach. And we didn't want to kill everything else. He had bees, he had other things he was worried about. So it, it works really well. It basically targets cells inside the gut, makes little micro tears in it, and then the toxins that are attached to it um, attack those areas and it eats it from the like busts it open, eats it from the inside out. Great stuff. Um, great way to kill a bug. And so it's not harmful to mammals, 
for Saki is targeting for caterpillars. It's super effective. There's a couple other strains that are targeted for other pests, but I'm a huge fan of this for Lepidopteran pests. I'm gonna skip some of these, and they're, they're gonna be in your handout, so I'm taking too much time. Um, so I wanna go over a key insect arthropod pests to the study, um, just to make sure we all know what we're looking at. And uh, skip the poll. What is this? Just shout it if you know it. What is this? What's the main bug that we're worried about in this? Is it this is a nymph of a psyllid. So this is a juvenile psyllid. They look funky, don't they? Yeah, so we have some for you to look at because we've gotten pictures of the home citrus email of like, what is this? And I forget who told me, but it looks like they have mad eyebrows with their little antennae, and it totally looks like a mad eyebrow face. Great way to remember it. You can look at it on the microscopes later. So that's what they look like up close and personal, little mad eyebrows. I think they're adorable, but that is the nymph of the psyllid. So if somebody comes to your clinic with this, you know who it is. We're gonna skip that. We've already talked about these, we've talked about leaf mites. I wanna spend a little time on your predators, and I only have like two minutes left, so bear with me. All right, lady beetles and ladybugs. We mostly know the adults of these, but it's also really important that you guys know what the juveniles look like. I will say most master gardeners recognize these, but there are always a handful that don't. Um, so I gave a talk a couple weeks ago, and there are folks who actually hadn't recognized the juveniles. So the juveniles are really important. They kind of like, um, I don't think this, but my PhD advisor said they look like little alligators. Um, not so much. Um, but they crawl around. They eat a ton. This is the life stage that eats the most. When you're a bug and you're a juvenile, your job is to get fat. Eat as much as you can, get as fat as you can, and you make a nice, healthy adult. So the adults eat, the bees eat the most. So if you really want these, don't squish them, don't remove them, keep them around. And it doesn't matter who it is, because some people love to hate on Harmonia and Acerus, the multi-pollinated leaf beetle. It's a great predator, it's here, just enjoy it. Um, and then we have some other really cool little ones we don't see that often. So these are really small. Um, on the very top left, right-hand side, um, actually I guess going to the left-hand side, uh, that is Cryptolimus montrezuri. That is the mealy bug destroyer. So if you have a major mealy bug problem, you can actually buy those for leaves. They do a pretty darn good job. Only the problem is, like all lady beetles, when the food runs out, they die. Um, so I know Jamie, I'm watching. I'm gonna run a minute over sorry. And then that's so fast as these lists is the white white predator. And this is what their larvae look like. So the larvae are funky looking, but very, very, very important because they're so Some other beetles that are useful, these are carabids or ground beetles, they'll eat anything. So if you have aphids, like some aphids like to fall when they get scared, these will gobble them up. As soon as they hit the ground, they're gone. And they're great predators. We also have predatory piercing sucking insects. So we have spine soldier bugs. This is going to look a lot like your uh, pentatone or sleep bugs, um, but it eats other bugs, which is super cool. Minute pirate bugs, great predators for the small squishy stuff. I think you can still buy them for leaves. Nabids are a very commonly occurring organism. We see them a lot. And they eat a lot of the small squishies, those nice little pokey mouth parts. Um, and the assassin bugs, I actually just collected one off my porch the other week, and so I'm sorry to say it went into one of my students' collections for the fall, but it is a cool bug, great predator. They nab all sorts of stuff with that beak. And then this is an assortment. There's tons of these things. If you Google assassin bug, you're going to see every shape, color, size you can imagine. There's tons of them. I know, I know. Parasitic wasps. Huge variety, they look crazy, they do awesome stuff. We even have ones that unfortunately affect our good bugs. So uh, we do have to be careful about who we're putting out there and keep an eye on it. But for the most part, most of our predatory wasps really are hugely helpful and they're just really cool looking. Only one minute over. I'm gonna hold my questions. I will be in the, the uh, hands-on session in the back with